Sometimes when you see something, it feels like you should say something. And the other day I saw a video talking about Melissa Lucio. Melissa Lucio is on death row for the death of her daughter, Mariah Alvarez. But for a number of reasons, it looks like she's innocent. Her execution is scheduled for April 27th, 2022. And at the time of this video, there's really not much time. So let's talk about why she's likely innocent and what we can do about it. Lucio's background is complicated. At the age of 16, she got married. I can't find anything on her husband, so I don't know if this was someone the same age or an older person, but at the very least, the situation seems unstable and harmful. Lucio says she got married at such a young age to escape her childhood. She had a tough home life. When she was a child, she was molested by multiple family members, one of them being her mother's boyfriend. However, marriage didn't help her get away from abuse. Instead, she found herself in yet another abusive situation, where her husband was violent. And when he eventually left her, Lucio then started seeing a man named Robert Alvarez, who was also abusive. Alvarez and Lucio then had Mariah, and by that time, Lucio had 11 children. Lucio lived in poverty and struggled with drug addiction. She tested positive for cocaine some point after Mariah's birth, and her children were placed into foster care. Lucio's caseworker described the scenario as chaotic. The older teenagers looked over the younger kids. However, there were no signs of Lucio physically abusing her children. In fact, one of Lucio's sisters said that she was too passive when it came to discipline. Over the next couple of years, Lucio worked hard to meet the state's reunification plan, and Lucio was reunited with her children. With the family reunited, they were crammed into a two-bedroom apartment on the second floor, which required going up a dilapidated staircase. This staircase was dangerous for kids to walk up and down unsupervised, especially for Mariah who had a congenital foot deformity. The family planned to move into a first floor apartment that was only blocks away. On Thursday, February 15th, 2007, Lucio was busy readying the apartment for the move, while Alvarez had taken three of the kids over to the new place. Before he left, Alvarez had told the kids to stay inside, but once he left, the kids went down the staircase to play in the yard. Mariah was upstairs with Lucio, and Lucio realized she was gone. Lucio walked outside to find Mariah at the bottom of the stairs, crying with a bloody mouth. Other than this visible injury, Mariah seemed mostly uninjured by the fall. But over the next 48 hours, there were red flags. Later on, Mariah threw up the tamales she ate. The next day, Mariah ate some cereal, but lost her appetite completely after dinner, only asking for juice. By Saturday, Mariah had trouble breathing and seemed lethargic. Lucio thought that she was coming down with a cold and put her to bed. To the untrained eye, these symptoms might seem like a series of random illnesses, but these are symptoms of cerebral edema, the swelling of the brain that happened when Mariah hit her head. If severe enough and left untreated, cerebral edema can cause death, which is sadly the case in Mariah's situation. When Alvarez came home early, he checked on Mariah. He found that she wasn't breathing, and he called the paramedics who rushed her to the emergency room. However, Mariah was pronounced dead. The paramedics were suspicious. When they had arrived, Lucio was sitting next to Mariah, but Lucio seemed unresponsive, perhaps in shock. When the paramedics cut off Mariah's clothes, they saw an array of bruises, which furthered their suspicion. Lucio had said that Mariah had fallen down the stairs, but didn't specify that this fall happened at the previous apartment, which had the tall and rickety staircase. The current apartment only had three steps on the first floor, and because of this, they didn't buy Lucio's story of Mariah falling down the stairs. That night, Lucio was taken directly from the hospital to the police station at 10 p.m., where a six-hour interrogation began. You know something is wrong. No, sir, I don't. You know something is wrong. No, sir, I don't. If I bring you all those pictures, if I beat you half to death, like that little child was beat, I bet you you'd die too. So I did not beat my daughter, sir. This is your chance to set it straight, because right now it looks like capital murder. Right now it looks like you're a cold-blooded killer. Now, are you a cold-blooded killer? No, I'm not. Or were you a frustrated mother who just took it out on her? We know somebody did it. We're trying to find out who did it. Please, look at me. It happens. Okay? We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all get upset. We already know what happened. We already know what happened. How do you feel when you see these pictures? What's going through your head? No, she was maybe the better. Basically, what they were doing is they were trying to make me admit that I was the one responsible for her fall. And I kept telling them that I hadn't that I hadn't hurt my daughter and they wanted me to admit to something that I was not capable of doing to my child. And um, the interrogation continued for maybe six, six, seven hours until three o'clock in the morning. They just kept pointing fingers at me and threatening me and telling me that I was gonna spend the rest of my life in prison and that I wasn't gonna be able to see the rest of my children grow up and get married. And, you know, they just kept throwing so many words at me and I just told them, 
I am responsible for Mariah's bruises. They wanted to hear something. I mean, I was not going to admit to causing her death because I wasn't responsible. Show me how you explained her. But it was it like, was it one time or was it several times? She's being interrogated without having them provide her any water. I don't know if they had a bathroom break and she didn't have anything to eat the whole day. Those are circumstances that are conducive to getting people to confess. Here's a woman who has acquiesced to the most horrific stuff by men in her life since the age of seven and has shown very little assertion against adult males in her life and um, now is, is grieving for the death of her daughter and um, is in a sense caving in to the whole process of the interrogation. She also has in her psychological makeup a sense of disassociation. Disassociation is almost like entering a hypnotic state where you're just shutting down. And that's what abuse victims do all the time. That's how they survive from childhood on. You know, the trauma is overwhelming, their defenses get overwhelmed, their ability to cope becomes overwhelmed, and they just start folding in on themselves. When they use the doll, they ask her to show them how the child was struck. You can almost see the wheels turning with Melissa to say, well, if indeed I did it, this is how I must have done it. Show me how you explained it. But it was it like, was it one time? Or was it several times? Several times. Show me how. But show me the same force you would use. Was your right or left hand? Left, right hand. Would you be standing up or sitting down? Both. Well, I'm going to just go with it and I'll comply and, and I'll show you. I don't think that she's showing them actual behavior that she did. When Lucio described spanking her daughter, this was used as a confession. Melissa's confession to his spanking is a false and coerced confession. Most trial attorneys would have filed what's called a pretrial motion to suppress the statement and would have brought in an expert during the motion hearing to testify that it was in fact a false confession, that it was coerced. Admitting to spanking your child is not admitting to murdering your child. And even more so, this statement was coerced. Lucio gave this statement because she felt that the detectives wouldn't end the six-hour investigation until she said something. It might be hard for some to understand why Lucio would even admit to spanking her child. However, Lucio is someone who has often acquiesced to the abuse and demands of the men in her life. It's not at all strange that Lucio would say that she spanked her child so that the detectives could hear something to end that six-hour interrogation. But after this coerced and false confession, there was no investigation. That was that. Margaret Schmucker, Melissa's current lawyer, stated, once they decided that she had done it, they put blinders on. And that was the end of the investigation. But there's a lot more to this case that deserves a full investigation. There's too much that doesn't add up. Lucio's kids had never seen her be violent. In fact, as mentioned earlier, family members said that she was too passive when it came to the lack of punishment towards her children. And while she was someone whose life was full of hardship, she found meaning and purpose in being a mother. She didn't meet the criteria for mothers who kill their children. Those mothers were categorized into approximately six different groups. One was the mother who was you know, subject to severe mental illness. Melissa didn't have severe mental illness. Another uh, kind of parent might have been one who um, was retaliatory toward the child, that the child offended or, or disappointed them in some way and the mother retaliated. She didn't fit that kind of criteria. Um, another one would be that uh, they had a history of prior violence against children. She didn't fit that criteria. It was likely that there was something more that accounted for what happened because it didn't seem to be that Melissa's personality and history fit the nature of the crime. So what is going on? The first piece of evidence that points to Lucille's innocence is that she was never alone with Mariah during the 24 to 72 hours that Mariah had fallen down the stairs and then passed away. As her lawyer points out, there were always at least one or two other children with her, if not the whole family. Any of those children would have seen Lucille beat her child and all of them say that they witnessed no such thing. So where do the bruises come from? The veteran forensic pathologist and former chief medical examiner in Kansas City, Missouri, Thomas Young, has an answer. For years, Young has sounded the alarm about forensic science practices that led to wrongful convictions, and he is certain that a wrongful conviction has been made in Lucio's case, stating that the initial conclusion that Mariah's death was caused by abuse was pure guesswork. Young concludes the child's cause of death was blunt head injury, delayed effects, and that the manner of death was an accident. 
Young states that when Mariah hit her head falling down the stairs, there was cerebral edema, a swelling of the brain. Young states, it's not entirely clear why this happens, but it does happen to children who have head trauma, even a relatively minor type of head trauma. They can develop this reactive brain swelling. If this is left untreated, this condition can trigger a series of cascading effects that develop over several days. The brain trauma and subsequent swelling lead to poor blood circulation. There isn't sufficient oxygenated blood getting to the brain, which in turn causes tissue damage, Young said. What follows is a serious blood clotting disorder known as disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which can cause bruising anywhere, including on the internal organs. As a result, any kind of minor handling of a child, the child would develop bruises. But if Mariah's bruises were caused by her head injury from falling down the stairs, did anyone actually see her fall? And the answer is yes. There was an indication that uh, the da one of the daughters, Alexandra, um, had admitted to her uh, that she was responsible for Mariah falling down the stairs. In fact, Alexandra, or Alex, was abusive to Mariah. Mariah really was terrified of Alex because Alex was real mean to her. I saw Alex bang Mariah's head onto the ground and with, with no feelings, she didn't care what she did. She didn't care that she, did, that she hurt Mariah. Lucia never said anything about Alexandra pushing Mariah down the stairs or the previous abuse. In fact, during the interrogation, Escalong the Texas Ranger was especially adamant that Lucio's demeanor told him all he needed to know. From the moment he walked into the interview room, he knew that she had done something wrong. Innocent people fight back, he explained. They're going to tell you. Get out of my face. I didn't do anything. Leave me alone. I want my attorney. But Lucio remained slouched over, avoiding eye contact. A classic sign that someone is hiding the truth. So was Melissa hiding something? I told my mom, let's go visit Melissa without the kids. We're not taking the kids. So it's just me and my mom. So I get there, Melissa comes out with a smile and she sits, she sat there. And I ask her, Melissa, I'm gonna ask you something. I'm gonna ask you something, but don't answer me. Just nod your head, yes or no. I know my mom turned around because I had already discussed that with my mom. And I told her what Alex hit Mariah. And she just stared at me. She didn't say yes, she didn't say no. She just put her hand here and she put her head down and she started to cry. Well, that's all you had to tell me, Melissa. Because what mother is gonna admit, she didn't admit it to me, but her actions told me everything. Alexandra's abuse towards Mariah is important information to the case. Mariah did fall down the stairs, and not only did she fall down the stairs, she was pushed down the stairs by another sibling who was admitted to this. This is really important information to the case, but it was never brought up during Lucio's trial. And not because nobody knew, but because the information was suppressed by, at the time, public defender Peter Gilman, Lucio's own lawyer. Yes, there, there, there are those two, mo those two important people that I told. And, there, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that Mr. Gilman wrote it down, but he, he never brought it up in nothing. Mr. Gilman then did not bring that information um, before the jury during Melissa's trial at all. Lynn Marie Garcy, a private investigator working on Lucio's case, confronted Peter Gilman. I said, well, would you tell me if you knew about that uh, Alexis is the one that, that really pushed that baby down that stairs? No, I, I, no, no. And I said, you knew about it, Peter. I said, because it was in your, your notes. And he says, oh, he said, why would I want to ruin a teenager's life? He said, she had her whole life ahead of her. He said, she's not my client, no ways. And I'm like, no, but Melissa was your client. Why would you send her to death row when you've been told by witnesses that she didn't do this? We're not going to discuss this no more. We're, we're, I'm, I'm just not discussing this case no more. And he just scooted me right on out the door. Lucio's lawyer, Peter Gilman, was a negligent public defender. Not only did he suppress important evidence to Lucio's case, he also didn't ask any of the kids to testify, many of whom were witnesses. He also didn't ask any of Melissa's family to testify. You would think that an attorney that is that is uh, trying to defend your sister, he would want to know something about us and never, never. Nobody spoke in her behalf, nobody. My mom, why didn't my mom get up there? You know, my mom is her mother, the person that gave birth to her that knew her. Her children, nobody. Nobody, her friends or people, you know, did they even care to ask people that, that knew her, her tenants or anybody that lived around her, her, nobody, nobody. There was nobody on her behalf, nobody. Peter Gilman left out important witnesses. He didn't try to suppress Lucio's coerced confession. He intentionally left important evidence out. He wasn't just an incompetent lawyer. He was so bad, it almost seemed intentional. 
and there's good reason to suspect that this could be true. To better understand this, we need to first take a look at Armando Villalobos, the Cameron County District Attorney, or DA. And in case not everyone knows what a DA is, a DA is an elected official whose job is to prosecute crime. However, there is a real issue with the DA's prosecution of people. Often, DAs take an approach being tough on crime in order to get reelected. And this tough on crime strategy includes more arrests and convicting more people. However, this approach doesn't address the root causes of crime, which is often poverty and a lack of resources. But because people buy into the idea that more arrests equals more safety, DAs promote just that. They make a lot of arrests, publicize it, and are then re-elected. And that's not even considered corruption, it's simply what is encouraged in our current system. We finalized over 10,000 cases. As a prosecutor, I deal in facts. And the fact is, I need your vote to help me see that justice is done in Cameron County. Hey, some people don't like that the U.S. has the world's largest prison population, but I say it's not large enough. I think we can probably squeeze in some more people. And if you vote for me, I promise to squeeze in as many people as I can into prison. In many ways, Armando Villalobos was no different from most district attorneys. He wanted to get reelected, and to do this, his strategy was to be tough on crime. However, in a previous murder case that he prosecuted, where the defendant was found guilty, Villalobos had given the defendant 60 days to get his affairs in order. This is very unusual. When people are found guilty of murder, they usually stay in jail before going to prison. However, Villalobos gave this person some free time, who unsurprisingly took the opportunity to flee. The media blasted Villalobos for this, and Villalobos needed to rehabilitate his image. Image. And Melissa Lucio's case was the perfect opportunity to do this. She was poor, so she couldn't afford a private attorney. And this case was big news. She was the first Latina woman to be put on death row in the state of Texas. And this kind of publicity could be the perfect opportunity to fix his career. The DA had an investment in prosecuting Lucio. And this could also be an indication that Lucio's lawyer did as well. Right after Lucio's case, Gilman got a better job at the DA's office and apparently works there to this day. This means that right after Lucio's case, Peter Gilman got a job to work for the very people who prosecuted Lucio. However, the suspicion around Gilman and Villalobos doesn't stop there. Eventually it became apparent that Villalobos profited from the drug cartel, where he would take the cut of the profits from drugs while allowing them to be trafficked. He was charged for nine counts of public corruption and found guilty of seven of them. He served a 13 year sentence. Michael Wynn, the prosecutor for Villalobos' case, says that there are several cases where Mr. Villalobos put people on death row. And yes, every single one of those cases should be examined. Villalobos has tampered with many trials, and there's no reason to rule out that this was also the case with Lucio's trial as well. All in all, this evidence points to Lucio's innocence. Lucio's case never got an investigation, but when we do investigate, we find a mountain of evidence that adds up to Lucio being innocent in a broken system that has failed her, like it's failed so many others. She has no history of being violent towards her children. Her so-called confession to spanking was coerced. Her lawyer suppressed evidence that would have changed her case, and the prosecution in her trial was corrupt. Lucio's story aligns with Mariah's injuries, as confirmed by an experienced forensic pathologist, and Lucio's account of what happened aligns with what other witnesses saw. All of this adds up to Lucio being innocent of a murder, and yet, she is still on death row, about to be murdered herself. This hasn't just devastated Melissa Lucio's life, it's devastated the life of her family and friends as well. After it all happened, we got sent to foster care, so we were all separated. Every night, we would cry and say that we missed our mom. There's all this time that was lost. If they actually investigated, you know, like looked into what happened, we wouldn't be here. We'd be with her. Everything would have been different. Nobody knows what we've been through, what we suffered. How hard it is for us to know that she's on the throw when she shouldn't be. And yet there's nobody there to set her free. She don't belong there, but yeah, we, we need to continue to live. She is just a pleasant spirit. Always believed she was innocent because of her character. There was something yeah. that blows about Melissa that you, that is just different. It's just a tragedy. And like I said earlier, this is deeply personal for me and Maggie, um, women who have been incarcerated in the state of Texas, who have suffered the type of trauma that Melissa has suffered and to watch her in that interrogation room dissociate. I've seen Maggie do it when, when we're in stressful situations. I know it because I've been there and, and uh, it's, it's just a travesty and, and I don't know how I'm going to cope or handle uh, or many people that are in this fight, especially her family. I just, I can't, my mind won't even let 
let me think about, you know, the worst case scenario. So please, if you're watching, please take action. During Lucio's 15 year prison sentence, the lives of her family and friends have been devastated. Can you imagine someone you love being innocent and on death row? Lucio's family is on the front lines, fighting for Lucio's innocence every day. And they shouldn't have to be. They shouldn't have to be the ones to do a proper investigation. And they shouldn't have to fight for the state to not kill someone they love. Just saying this out loud sounds dystopian. Prisons ruin lives, whether someone is wrongfully convicted or not. The majority of the prison population is poor, and that's not an accident. Prison isn't for protection, it's a way to profit off of the poor. And at 2 million people, the US has the highest prison population in the world. That's 2 million people who are locked up, stripped of their human rights, and abused. Not to keep society safer, as prisons don't address the root cause of crime, but instead to profit off of the inmates and prison system itself. And this harm doesn't only affect people incarcerated, but the family and friends of those who have loved ones incarcerated as well. Abusing people as punishment helps no one. We need to do better. If we want to work towards living in a humane society, we should not let such a mindlessly destructive and abusive system continue. We need to build a justice system that is restorative, not punitive. Not only for the sake of those who are wrongfully convicted, but for the sake of everyone. So in this moment, let's take a stance against the injustice of this prison system and focus on helping Melissa Lucio and her family. If you want to help, you can share this video. You can also watch and share the documentary, The State of Texas vs. Melissa, or the article, Rush to Judgment, which are both referenced in this video and are linked in the description below. Another way to help is to try to get Melissa Lucio's name trending on social media. You can also donate to Lucio's GoFundMe, but perhaps one of the most impactful things you can do is to write a letter. I will link a letter writing template that was provided by FTP, or Fight Toxic Prisons, in the description below. Feel free to use this template to write a letter. Since writing letters is really stressful, I mean, I do like writing letters to friends, I grew up with Animal Crossing, so it ingrained that value in me, but I hate writing political letters to beg the state to spare the life of someone. It's not fun. So I thought it might be better if we did this as a group. So after this video premieres, there's going to be a live stream where we do a letter writing campaign. To celebrate, I'll ring this bell anytime someone writes a letter. We'll also be calling the Cameron County DA, Luis Vissans. I'll leave the live stream up for as long as it's relevant, so people can still hang out and write letters. And hopefully I'll see you there. Thank you to all my patrons who have supported me, and I hope to see you all at the letter writing campaign stream.